infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And on today's show, we're going to take a look at a nematode parasite that, if left untreated, can be fatal. And this parasite is called Capillaria philippinensis. Now, joining me now to discuss this roundworm is friend of the show, author, Rosemary Drizdell. Hello, Rosemary. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Robert. Pleased to be here. Okay. Um. Can we just start out with a short uh, Reader's Digest summary of a little bit of the history of this this species of Capillaria and how it was discovered? Yes, Capillaria philippinensis is a more recently discovered parasite, actually. Uh, it was first reported in 1963 in the Philippines, as the name would suggest. We did know about another species um, previously to that, which was Capillaria hepatica, and therefore it made it a little easier to figure out what this thing was when people first noticed it. But in 1963, there was only one reported case, and it was thought that it was a very rare, sort of um, unusual thing that wasn't likely to happen again. So it took uh, a rather larger outbreak a few years later to make people take more notice of it, and even as much as 10 years after that to figure out what the life cycle of it was and how people were catching it. Okay, great. Then other than the Philippines, where else is this parasite endemic? The other place it's particularly noted is in Thailand, but it does pop up in other parts of the world. Sometimes in Southeast Asia, a couple of cases from Egypt, and I noticed in the literature that they think they've found eggs in fossil feces from France from prehistoric times. So it's not a brand new parasite, but it's certainly one that hasn't been well known. Now, can you talk a little bit about the life cycle and how does one become infected? One becomes infected by eating raw fish. So the, the normal life cycle of the parasite probably goes through birds and fish. If the birds have the, if a bird, a fish-eating bird, has the parasites in its intestine, it can pass eggs, perhaps worms in its feces. Then, if these are eaten by fish, the fish become infected. The parasites might be found in the in the viscera or the you know the sort of guts of the fish, or they might also be in the fish's tissues. Then, if a bird or a human comes along and eats that fish raw, they get the parasite in their intestine. The um, it tends to live within the tissues, especially in the small intestine, and so because it does that, it can do a lot of damage there. Some parasites live in the lumen or in the open space of the intestine, but this one likes to burrow into the tissue. And uh, as I said in the intro, this, if it's untreated, can be fatal. Um, Rosemary, can you talk about capillaria's pathology? Yes. One interesting thing about capillaria is that unlike most of the worms that we get intestinally, this one, the females produce eggs, they produce um, sometimes live larvae, and the eggs sometimes will hatch before they're actually passed into in the stool. So these larvae can then reinvade the tissue. So we can have a, an increasing number of parasites in the intestine without it ever going to the fish part of the life cycle. So you can get a very, very large number of worms living in your intestine. And it's sometimes been described as a cholera-like illness. Uh, cholera is sort of famous for causing extremely uh, watery diarrhea and making you lose a lot of fluid very quickly. So this does cause a very serious and prolonged diarrhea, lots of loss of fluids, abdominal pain, uh, weight loss, as you might imagine. Eventually, emaciation, people become very, very thin. And uh, death can occur finally due to heart failure or electrolyte imbalance, protein deficiency, and even secondary infection. Because you can imagine if 
worms are burrowing through your intestinal lining, they can be dragging a lot of bacteria around with them. So it is quite often fatal. Okay, quite a serious pathogen. Um, mm. Rosemary, how is it diagnosed? And if it's microscopically, how does it appear? We could see worms, larvae, or eggs in a stool sample from somebody who has uh, Capillaria philippinensis. The eggs are quite characteristic. They look like Trichuris trichiura eggs, which are sometimes described as a tea tray with a, a sort of a plug at each end. Capillaria looks very like that, but it has a more striated, so the shell looks like it has little lines in it almost, which which makes it different from Trichuris. So if you were to see a shell like an egg with a shell like that in a stool sample, you would be very suspicious of Capillaria. Now, can Capillaria be transmitted from person to person, or is it only through ingesting fish? It's only through ingesting the raw fish, mm -hmm. and, um, which is fortunate. Yes. <laughs> and uh, concerning treatment, treatment is obviously really critical with this parasite. What is it? Yes, the usual antiparasitic drugs that we mention so often, albendazole and mebendazole, are both quite effective. They do have to be given for a fairly long period of time because, well, probably because larvae continue to emerge from the tissues mm -hmm. after the first treatment. So um, 10 or more days, depending on which drug you're using. And uh, finally, um, what are you going to tell us about Capillaria philippinensis that we don't already know? Well, the story of how we learned most of what we know now about Capillaria philippinensis comes oddly from the Vietnam War when there were some American scientists posted in that part of the world and an outbreak of this intractable diarrhea was reported in the northern Philippines. So they were sent there to investigate it, a, a parasitologist and an epidemiologist and some others got involved. They went to this uh, little village that was suffering from what was called the mystery disease of Pudok. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that place name properly. <laughs> but around the late 60s, they had an epidemic there of this intractable diarrhea, mostly among men. And in 67 alone, there were over a 1,000 cases with 77 deaths. And most of the deaths were males as well. So they proceeded to try and investigate this epidemic. And uh, in some of the uh, autopsies that were done, they found from around 60,000 up to as high as 200,000 worms per liter of bowel fluid. So huge, huge numbers of parasites. It took them 18 months to kind of exhaust their possibilities of potential hosts. They didn't know where people were getting this parasite. They apparently checked 50,000 potential hosts. I can hardly imagine how many, how you could find that many species of things in one little village. But anyway, and they, they still didn't iron it all out, but they did discover that the source of the infection were a couple of man-made, human-made lagoons that the people were fishing in and they were bathing and washing and washing their laundry in. And the, uh, of course, when they were washing their laundry, people that were sick, they were reinfecting the water in the lagoon. So if it started with birds, it got much worse with people. And the reason that most of the people who died were men was because the men did most of the fishing, mm -hmm. and they were apparently quite fond of uh, sampling their catch while they were fishing. So the fish were infected, and the men were getting very high levels of the parasites in their intestines. Um, so now that was how we first started to figure out that it was fish and then probably fish eating birds. And if you read the literature now, you still see the words probably, maybe, but we're pretty sure that it is fish eating birds. And that is also probably why it pops up in all kinds of odd places because, as you know, birds migrate. So they could take it virtually anywhere that they travel to. Um, and that's why it's uh, that's why it's spreading a little bit, although the numbers aren't really increasing from year to year, probably because most people don't go around eating small raw fish. Well, got to love medical history. That's so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you once again, Rosemary, for your time and expertise and your history lesson. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure.
If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X dot com. Or email at info at glymedx.com.